Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly Q&A special here on Urbanist. Every single month in the beginning of every first Friday, I offer a Q&A special. For the first 15 minutes, I'll have any questions about travel or Urbanist related questions. This show, as many of you know, is about travel with uh, history, architecture, urbanism, and food being the main focus. And then after those 15 minutes, I open up the floodgates so you can ask me about anything. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. Let me know where you're watching from. And uh, I was reading this book called How to Be Danish, uh, written by Patrick Kingsley. Let me show it to you. It's a really good book about Danish culture. There's not too many books I could find about uh, Denmark in English. Uh, this is one of the few ones, especially a book about the culture. So this is really cool. Welcome, welcome everyone. Nice to see you here. I end up getting dinner um, tonight. But um, as many of you know, Copenhagen is very expensive. So I end up getting a nice uh, piece of bread. For dinner. I am lucky enough to make a nice living from what I do. I'm very grateful. Uh, every day I don't miss a time thinking how grateful I am that I can entertain people around the world by offering them armchair travel so you can see the world from the comfort of your own phone. But Denmark is pushing my limits <laughs> in terms of the, of the budget <laughs> that I have. So I'm going to enjoy a nice piece of bread for dinner tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if you have food, it, it, be grateful. I, I, I'm, I'm joking around. I'm being, I'm being a little bit... Uh, I'm not sure how to say the word fascist. I got to learn how to say that word. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm joking around. I do have bread. I have eggs. This is for breakfast. I'm joking around. <laughs> I luckily did buy a little bite to eat. I'm not that hungry because that was, <laughs> that was uh, pretty filling. So I bought a quinoa salad. But you won't believe how much this quinoa salad and I am getting a golden latte made with uh, rice coconut milk. You won't believe how much this cost. Let me know. What do you think this cost? In New York, I would tell you this would cost about $12. What do you think? This little salad, quinoa with uh, some veggies, some garbanzos, uh, which are uh, chickpeas, and goji berries. A lot of people are guessing correct. Yeah, about $20. A little bit less than $20. Yep, $20. Which was actually the best deal I can find here in Denmark. There were things far more expensive than that. Kay says, I'll send you some butter for the bread. Thank you so much, Kay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, Denmark, Denmark is pushing my limits in terms of, of my budget. I, I, I spend a lot of money today in the food and in the postcards and things like that. So for the first 15 minutes, feel free to ask me anything about, about, about travel, about urbanists. And then I'll open up the floodgates to anything. So Doreen says, why are things so expensive? I think one of the aspects is that Denmark is a very rich country. But you have to take into account that Denmark is not that big of a country. So I think that might be one of the reasons people here are paid really well. I think Norway is more expensive than Denmark. Uh, I've heard horror stories about Norway. Being a gorgeous, the audio is crackling, says Ron. It, are, is, is everyone able to hear me okay? I'm gonna, mic is a bit muffled. How's it supposed to be muffled? All right, does that work? It's crackling, why? I've been having such bad luck with live streaming these past few days. 
and my gim and my uh, tripod is also broken. Um, so let me know if you hear me now clearly. So I'm using the DJI mic. Problem with the DJI mic, it's a beautiful microphone. It's, it's much smaller than Rode Wireless Go, and the receiver hooks up directly into my phone, uh, which is awesome. No wiring, but the mics lose quality sometimes out of nowhere because of frequencies or whatnot. Kevin says, where would you go after Denmark? You know, I still have all, I, I have July planned. You have to stay tuned for July. But when it comes to August, I think I realize I might need to go to a place that my money will extend a bit further. So um, UK was already expensive enough with uh, lodging. I, I paid for the group trip, which I, everyone knows that I paid $2,800, give or take, uh, for that group trip, uh, which was a, a good deal, I would say. It's crackling again. Let me know if you're hearing crackling. I'm not sure why, why would there be crackling? Why doesn't my mic work as normal? All right, I'm gonna see if this works better. Let me know. There's interference, I'm not why. <laughs> Where's the interference coming from? Oh, oh my God, ladies and gentlemen. Ology. Tammany says, it only hears, uh, you only hear crackling when you put it behind you. I buy these expensive microphones and, and they provide so many issues. Mirna says, uh, clear sound where you are at. Okay, I'm going to try facing now directly. No, no way is it not facing the, the microphone. Let me know if it sounds better now. The mic is, the mic cable is pinched. It might be this, this, these, uh, labs are, are sensitive. Sorry about that, everyone. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Susie. Hello. Do let me know your name. What language is that? Is that uh, Mandarin? Do let me know how to say your name or, or, or kanji. Isabel's hearing me fine. Oh, I'm glad you are. Hmm. Good. Wow. So, um, Susie says, go back to France. <laughs> yeah, so, in August, more dill, says uh, Tammany. Yeah, this has more dill. A lot of dill. I like dill. This one's a bit more reasonable amount of dill. Too much dill makes me feel a little bit yucky, but that one's good. So, as I mentioned, I have already July planned, so stay tuned for July broadcast. But uh, I, now I realize in August I might need to plan a place that my money goes a little bit further. Because um, luckily Denmark is only a week I'm here. Eugene says, are you going to Ireland next? No, no, no Ireland in the plan. Uh, Pink Lady says, love the shirt and just got your Paris postcard, which is a perfect timing because I plan on adding my Urbanist scrapbook today since I just got pics printed from your Paris trip. Hey, Susu, that should be Susu, right? Susu, thank you so much for tuning in. Susu is making like a cool Urbanist scrapbook. Maybe one day I'll show it to you. Uh, Susu, um, maybe we'll meet up one day in her so you can show the Urbanist public the the beautiful scrapbook, but uh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Alexander says, go to Barcelona. And Susie says, I got your postcard next to K's on my fridge. Oh, cool. K gave me a postcard. That's awesome. Iras a casa, uh, iras a Puerto Rico. Um, as 
Kevin. So Kevin uh, asks, are you going to Puerto Rico? Tú sabes, yo quiero ir a Puerto Rico. Estoy bien tentado ahora mismo a, a pronto a ir a Puerto Rico. Porque a mí es, es un país tan bellísimo que sería bien bueno enseñarlo en videos en vivo. Um, ahora mismo no, porque voy a quedarme aquí en Europa dos meses más. Pero mejor voy a Puerto Rico pronto. Puede ser. So, eh, y tiene pregun cualquier pregunta en español, puede preguntar en español también. Los primeros 15 minutos va a ser de uh, solo pregunta de viaje y después tú puedes preguntar cualquier cosa. So, I will, will I go to Puerto Rico? Yes, I would go to Puerto Rico. I would love to go to Puerto Rico. It's such a beautiful country and I'm very tempted to go soon. Not for these next two months because I'm doing Europe for the next two months, but um, yeah, maybe Puerto Rico soon. Trish says, do your family ever meet up with you in your travels? Not so far in all my entire history of urbanists. We were going to take a group trip in June 2020 to London. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic, so all those plans were canceled. And I was going to do videos whilst my, um, my family was in London as well, and I was spending time with them. Um, I went to, actually, I did go to Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, you met, you met one family member in Puerto Rico. You met my cousin, Larissa. Look, I'll, some of those videos are posted to the Urbanist Bonus. So I have like a second YouTube, I have like three YouTube channels. My personal one, Ariel Vieira, where I post like music videos uh, that I've made or short films. Uh, Urbanist Bonus is the other channel. And that's where I post, uh, uh, I have posted older live videos that predate me starting live videos in YouTube in 2020. And part of that was going to Puerto Rico. And I did hang out with family. And uh, my cousin Larissa was featured in uh, like three live videos, which was fun. Hey, Susie says, I watched some of your PR videos with my mom and she loved them. Oh, I'm so glad your mom loved the uh, Puerto Rico live videos. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, Puerto Rico is such a gorgeous, gorgeous country. So I, I, I plan to go soon. Do you plan on uh, crashing another wedding photo uh, trip? Uh, do you plan on crashing another wedding, says Thomas. I would love to. That would be awesome. So uh, Chris is referring to last year when I crashed a wedding in Santorini. It was awesome. It was a wedding between... Uh, a couple in New York and New Jersey that had Greek roots. Well, one of them had Greek roots. The other one was Jewish. And they got married in Santorini. And they had their entire family there. And I was chatting with one of the family members and he told me everything about the, the wedding. And it was really cool. And I just I kind of walked with them. <laughs> and uh, the priest blessed me as I passed by him. Uh, the, ortho the Greek Orthodox priest. So, yeah, it was a really, really fun video. So you could refer to that video last year. Hey, Wendy says, eight hours, I won't get back. So Wendy's making uh, reference to a, I was hired to live stream a wedding, not on my channel. That was on the Highly Varlet channel last June. And that was an eight hour live stream, very long. Is it raining where you're at? Barris, yeah, it was raining all day. Currently, no, it's not raining. Hello, hello, everyone. Nice to see you here. Hello, Joe. Welcome. She had been, um, Susie says, your mom hasn't, hadn't been in Puerto Rico since a teenager. Oh, that's a shame, uh, Susie. I'm curious, uh, I've, I've, I've had quite a bit of uh, Puerto Rican followers based in America. And a good portion of them haven't visited Puerto Rico in years. I'm curious as to why. It's so close. And if, if you are next to a major airport, it's not that expensive. I think flights should be like a $200. Uh, so I'm very curious. And let me know if any... Uh, Puerto Rican viewers are tuning in. Let me know. 
uh, wh why haven't you visited Puerto Rico in a while? Clash of YouTuber Titans in Santorini said, uh, said George, was there another YouTuber in Santorini at the time? Any, any other ridiculous priced items you can mention says Q&A. $5, it was f a little bit more, five seventy-five dollars per stamp, international postcard stamp, which is insanely expensive. Um, postcards, the l cheapest ones, the like run-of-the-mill ones, or one dollar, or a little bit more, one twenty-five. The I got some really cool postcards that are like made from hand paintings. Those were more expensive. Those were like five dollars each. Yeah, I spend a lot of money in postcards. So ten ten lucky mega urbanists will be getting some of the most expensive postcards I have ever have ever have sent. I can't send more. Uh, so ten is the limit. And I'm going to pick people at random. So if you get a postcard, please cherish that, that postcard. Most people will speak English? Asked Nina. Yes, most people do speak English here. Uh, the majority of people are very proficient in English. Uh, for example, I, I had brunch. I had a, basically a toast with poached eggs and salmon, smoked salmon, and I had two coffees, two Americanos, and I asked for water at this restaurant. They gave me tap water and charged me $3.50 for tap water. I'm not sure if that's normal here. Let me know, uh, Danish... Danish viewers, but yeah, I got charged three fifty for tap water, so I ended up spending for one brunch on my own about forty two dollars. Yeah, things here are expensive. I'm not so. Uh, that's why uh, a few people have asked me to cover more food. I don't feel too too excited to cover food if it's that expensive. But you'll see, you'll see other cool stuff here in Copenhagen tomorrow at least. Why do you think English is so common, says Garrett? Uh, B. Chris. Great question. I think the, the case for, for English is that Denmark is a small country. So, and then, so Denmark is a small country, about uh, less than 6 million people, which is smaller than the population than New York City. Scandinavia is also very small. Norway and Sweden also have very small populations. So these languages, not that many people speak them. So how do you compete on the international level? How do you compete if you don't know the language? So Denmark basically has no other choice but to be proficient in English. Unless if they intend on just trading with their Scandinavian brethren, they have to know English. So I think that's why everyone does, does learn English. In order to compete in commerce on a global scale, and then also for, um, for pop culture, for, for movies, uh, there's a whole host of industries that require... Uh, at least one lingua franca, as they say, one common language to be spoken. If it ain't English, it has to be at least Spanish, French, Mandarin, uh, maybe one of the Indian languages. There's not that many languages out there where you can get by uh, not knowing. You have to know at least one of those languages to compete. Are Puerto Ricans here in, in Copenhagen? I doubt there's that many Puerto Ricans here. <laughs> uh, Nina, that's a great question. I doubt it. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't met any Puerto Ricans here. <laughs> that's a good question. I wonder if there are. French used to be an international language. Now it's English. That's right, uh, armchair guru. Yeah, that's right. Are you going to Amsterdam to uh, sample the oregano? <laughs> See how it is compared to Seattle. 
So Tammany, full disclosure, I, I did not sample smoking oregano in Seattle. I sampled eating uh, gummies in Seattle. They were some of the best I've ever had in Seattle. I don't know, Amsterdam, if, if, if it ends up being covered in this trip, has to compete <laughs> with, with the gummies of Seattle. They were excellent. Some of the best I've ever had. Kay says, it doesn't seem so diverse here. No, Denmark is a pretty homo homogeneous country. Um, the stat, I think, was only like 10% of the country is from somewhere else. And uh, there's a lot of Middle Eastern and Afghanis here that are immigrants. Pretty, it's a very, very... Danish country. <laughs> Almost everyone here is Danish. Um, or they might be from nearby Sweden and they're going to look the same. Very similar. Hey, Darren, nice to see you here. Nihat says, how can I improve my English skills? I'm not the best person to ask that because I, know I don't do English learning, English uh, teaching. But... The way I learn other languages is by Duolingo. And the other way I learn languages is by YouTube videos. So Nihat, search YouTube or Duolingo. There's so many channels out there that teach English. So many. And if you want to learn, you can find someone who's your style and your pace. It helps significantly going head first into an English speaking environment. I say this because when I went to Italy, I had to learn a little bit of Italian. Now I'm not so good at Italian, but if I were to spend a few months in Italy, I have the feeling that I would get much more proficient in Italian. Um, same thing with France. I would get more proficient in French. It might be a little bit harder if the language is very different. So I would say I would have a harder time here in, in Denmark learning Danish. The Dog Chapel says a bottle of water costs five euros. The most expensive bottle of water I've spent so far is 325 here in, in Denmark. Uh, so yeah, things here are expensive. Hey, Darlene says, I enjoyed the boat ride. Oh, I'm so glad you do. That's awesome to hear. Ariel, you need to go food shopping and do your own cooking. We can all come for dinner. Uh, Susie, unfortunately, grocery shopping is not less expensive. Uh, you save a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, you save a little bit, but not too much. Um... I ended up doing uh, some small shopping uh, when I first got here, first night, because I got here just after 10 p.m. So most places, almost everywhere was closed for food. So I had to go to the nearby grocery store and buy something, something quick. Uh, so I ended, up making, um, I ended up making myself a toast with salmon and avocado. And then I bought uh, like two packs of water bottles. Uh, sparkling water, and I end up getting myself also a juice and two huge, two like one liters of yogurt. Because here they, they sell drinkable yogurt, natural, which is really good actually. Um, so I got that, which in the US probably cost me about $30. Here it cost me nearly $48 for that. So in, in the UK, UK food can be expensive out. So if you go out to a restaurant, it can, it can get expensive. But if you go grocery shopping in the UK, it's very cheap. It's cheaper than, than the US, for example. Trish says, I get why Iceland is expensive. They have to import everything. Uh, is, is it the same in Denmark? That's a good question. Denmark is actually one of the bigger exporters of pig 
in, I think in Europe, from what I read. Eugene says, you should do a Q&A some night on your channel. Eugene, <laughs> I'm doing it right now. <laughs> We're having a Q&A. <laughs> Literally right now. <laughs> and it's near, nearly night. <laughs> Hey, yes, feels nice to see you here. Okay, everyone. Um, uh, feel free to literally ask me anything you would like aside from travel. Susie says, says so it's bread and water for you. You know, I, I am grateful that I'm in a financial position where, yeah, I can afford a week travel in Denmark. But also, you know, let me know if this happens to you. Sometimes you don't feel like spending the money. Um, like the, those fish things I heard, had er, earlier today, the open face sandwiches. I see that they're good, but just don't feel like spending uh, $15 per each of them. So, um, so let me know if you've encountered that. It's, it happens in New York, you know, like uh, pasta carbonara. I love pasta carbonara. When I had it in Italy, I ate it almost every day. But in New York, you go to a lot of restaurants, they charge like $25 for pasta carbonara. I won't eat it. I don't, don't like going to restaurants for pasta carbonara. So I end up uh, making it at home, for example. So Wendy says, how do you handle criticism? I do not like unsolicited criticism. Never been a fan. If I don't ask you for feedback, I don't like it when someone gives it to me. So uh, I don't like the, uh, the people who leave comments that are criticism. There's, construct, there's good faith criticism and there's bad faith criticism. Good faith is meaning that they have your best intention in mind, your best intention. Um, the, myself, like if they're aiming at me, they have my best intention in mind. And they're doing it in good faith. The bad faith is in that they don't care about you. They just want to share their opinion or make fun of you or say something mean or something is going on in their life and they're just lashing out. Uh, when it comes to good faith criticisms, I, appre you know, I appreciate if someone has a nice criticism or a nice f piece of feedback. It is nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. But it's still my choice whether I want to read it or not. And it's still my choice whether I want to respond to it or not. So I've had a few instances where someone has given me uh, good faith criticism. And has, I, have not I did not respond. And then they said, hey, why didn't you respond? I gave you this. Why, why are you not grateful? If you give someone a gift... It's their choice to accept her or not. And um, I, I like to say this also to everyone out there. You don't owe anyone anything. You, you can be a decent human being. You can be a kind human being. But you don't owe anyone anything. Uh, from, from the perspective of, of someone who does entertainment, I don't owe anyone a message back. Um... Unless, unless if I'm doing a live video where it is an interactive kind of thing, it's for the live video. But after the live video, I don't owe anyone a message back. I don't owe anyone to meet up with them. I don't owe anyone um, anything else. I don't owe anyone a response on the comment. I am happy to sometimes respond to comments and respond to messages and sometimes uh, meet up with uh, cool viewers, but I don't owe anyone anything. You have to keep that. I would, I, I, I've noticed this happening a lot in the world. People like to make others feel guilty for not wanting to do something. There's a lot of guilt tripping in this world and guilt, guilt tripping is probably one of the worst things I think anyone could do in a verbal way. It's not nice. If you're not getting what you want from someone, let it go. Angie says boundaries are important. They are. They are. 
Vlad says, you really know how to give advice on boundaries. And this applies to travel. There are some cities more than others, like New York, for example, a lot of people will come up to you and make you feel bad if you don't give them money, make you feel bad if you don't stop to give them directions, make you feel bad if you don't stop to, I don't know, do whatever. Sometimes people are mentally unstable, so it's not coherent why they want your attention. You don't owe anyone anything. You don't, and if you're tripping, if you're going on a trip, you don't owe anyone. You don't owe someone on the street stopping you to ask for directions. You don't owe them to tell them directions. You can be a kind human being and say no in a kind way because you don't want to. Or you can say yes. But remember, you don't owe anyone anything. Uh, B. Chris says, have ever you missed a flight? No, I don't think so. I've only missed one train in my life. It was an Amtrak train, which actually was captured on live video. It was uh, before I went to Washington, D.C., and I missed that train. Uh, but luckily, they gave me a, the next train out. Mm. Somebody er earlier asked them, had I had any issues with immigration? Luckily, no. I got randomly stopped and questioned in London airport because they saw me filming a, a short TikTok. Uh, I, I, and, uh, and in the US, I did get in, like, interrogated for two hours when I came back from my Italy trip. I, indeed, I was angry when that happened. I did not like it. I felt, I felt like... Like... Um, the enemy. I'm very glad that the people in their in the borders all around the world are doing their job. There's a lot of people in the world that don't have your best interests at heart or don't have your country's interests at heart or your city's interests at heart. And we do have to give our thanks and hold gratitude for those border officers, the integrous ones, the ones who do their job with integrity, not the ones who are trying to bribe you or give you a hard time for giving you a hard time, but the, the integrous ones. And there's many, many countries around the world, a lot of the law enforcement has integrity. We have to give our thanks to that, to the border patrols, to... Um, Law enforcement in the U.S. is like the FBI. We have to give thanks to the FBI. They keep, keep us safe. Um, people all around the world, the military, we have to give our thanks to those people. We, we sometimes take it for granted, but you have to realize as an American, a North American, Canadian, Mexican, as uh, someone in Western Europe, you, we've had unprecedented peace for nearly a century at this point a little bit less than a little bit less than a century but uh many many decades that is a miracle if anything and we have to deeply hold in gratitude because there is a unfortunately a a pattern in the world that, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people who guilt trip others. I've noticed that this happens on a societal level. There's a lot of guilt tripping in society. There's a lot of making people and governments seem like they are the enemy, that they are bad, that they are uh, harming our lives, but there was, there's been much, there's been a lot of good that has come from our societal structures. So, yeah, sometimes uh, a specific policy might be very tough to swallow, uh, or 
It might be downright unfair, but the way to better our world is not to fight fire with fire, is not to throw gasoline onto the fire so it rages and burns everything around us. That's not the way. Hey, Susie says, I hope you're not going to, uh, to bed hungry. No, no, I'm not. No, no, no. This is more than enough. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really full from that, those open face sandwiches. Your thoughts on the importance of assertive communication as opposed to passive, aggressive, or combination thereof, says DS. Oh, that's a good question. I've been, I've been uh, going through this quite a bit. I'm actually glad I'm here in Denmark because as I mentioned, Denmark, the, the Danish are a very straightforward culture. They don't kind of BS. They tell you how they feel, uh, which might be a little bit shocking if you are American. And if they don't like what you're doing, they'll tell you, I don't like it. <laughs> Personally, but I've read a lot about it. Actually, I've encountered it with uh, colleagues that I have because I've worked with Danish companies before. Uh, so I've encountered this before. There's some downsides, um, but the upside of, of that type of directness is that You don't get to your, you don't put yourself in the position where you end up starting to hold a grudge or, or start fomenting resentment because you did not express how you felt at that moment. So there's a lot of uh, times in our lives where we really disagree with what someone did to us or what someone said to us. Or how someone treated us. And rather than say how we felt. Not in a way to uh, angrily lash out. Or to sob. <laughs> or to, you know, not, not to make a show. But we did not express our, our feeling or discontent. And so, since we didn't express it, we allow it to fester. And what happens when you leave a piece of fruit out? In the out and about, you know, you just let it be, it ends up starting to ferment, it ends up starting to, to degrade. And same thing happens with our feelings. If we don't uh, acknowledge them, they start fermenting, they start becoming rotten, and it starts eating you up from the inside. Same thing with, with, uh, with not saying what you feel. So I think it, it, there is a good benefit in being, being straightforward. There is a difference with bluntness. So bluntness can be used and not in the best interest of someone else. Bluntness can be used to just uh, kind of just blurt out how, uh, what you're thinking without really giving it some consideration. But I would say don't hold things in. Big problem with people who are not confrontational, anger festers. Right, anger festers. Yeah, that's right, Nina. That's right. Okay, so yeah. Sometimes. Am I happy? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with my life. Uh, I'm very happy with, with what I do. I'm very happy with who I am. Uh, I'm very happy for the people I have in my life. I think it's very important to not feel obligated to smile all the time. This is something that us Americans go through that the Danish don't have an issue with, <laughs> I can tell. Uh, but us Americans, you know, we, we, we kind of look down upon if someone's not smiling. We kind of assume that they're in a, in a terrible state, uh, that they are angry, that they are discontent for some reason. 
and we get nervous or we get uh, self-conscious when we don't see someone smiling. Um, but the thing is, the, the downside of that American smiliness is that it's not always genuine. So disingenuously smiling actually does more harm than good. It makes you feel bad <laughs> when you're dis disingenuously smiling. So I've noticed, I, I've learned to kind of uh, move beyond that habit. So if you see my earlier videos, I'm, I'm smiling a whole lot. Um, but sometimes I'm disingenuously smiling. Not, not out of, I don't want to deceive anyone. But it just means that I, I was just smiling either out of nervousness, I was smiling out of uh, uncom uh, uncomfortableness, awkwardness. I was just smiling. Uh, because that was the default that I learned from a young age growing up. But as time has gone by, I've, I've learned to stop doing that. So sometimes I'm not smiling. People are like, oh, are you okay, Ariel? <laughs> it's like, no, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> are you, any plans to come to Chicago, says Nikki? No, not in the moment. <laughs> I had a pretty crazy experience in Chicago. Kind of scared me away from that city. Watch my uh, Airbnb tour of Chicago. Do you know some words in Danish? No, just hey and tuck. <laughs> I gotta learn more Danish. Is that everyone here speaks English? Uh, and the Danes don't really, from what I've gathered and from what I've read, don't really want to speak English to you. My necklace is clashing with my mic, so let me remove my necklace. Susie says, but you're a happy chat. Indeed I am. Thank you so much, uh, Susie. So I got to remove my necklace because uh, it was clashing with my, with my mic. But I ended up getting this beautiful, beautiful necklace of Our Lady of Guadalupe from Portobello Road in London. And it was sold by these lovely Peruvian women. Only cost me about 10 pounds. Uh, but it's beautiful. I love it. I'm, I love, love, love uh, Our Lady Guadalupe. I think it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen in person. So you can watch my live video of that in Mexico City. Just blown away by it. So, so good to actually did two live videos of Our Lady Guadalupe. Susie says, uh, don't lose your necklace. Yes, <laughs> put it on top of my book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> S. Fields and a few other people were saying, are you, are you trying to hypnotize us? No, I'm not trying to hypnotize you. But you are feeling very relaxed. You're feeling nice and soft. You're sinking into a place of internal peace. <laughs> uh, what about the bracelet? There's no special meaning to the bracelet. I ended up getting it from a company called Miansai in, in New York City. They're really cool. <laughs> Nina, <laughs> Nina says, you will contribute stars. <laughs> Someone earlier asked me, um, Isabel says, I'm driving. <laughs> no, Isabel. <laughs> Please, do that. Hopefully, you're not watching. You're only listening. Joe says, I was hypnotized with Ariel a year ago. <laughs> uh, Danny says, where are you from? New York City. From Puerto Rico. Raised in New York. Why do I suddenly feel like donating a million stars, says Angie. <laughs> yeah, Angie. Yeah. Nicole says, don't scare me. <laughs> Fields, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, any preconceptions of Denmark that were different when you arrived, as Ron? Yeah, great question. I thought the Danish were going to be very serious. Uh, the Danish are indeed straightforward. I, de I definitely have noticed that. Um, 
and there's not much chit chat at all. But the Danes do smile. I thought this was going to be a country where I wasn't going to see too many smiles, uh, uh, you know, casually walking around. Even walking around, people are just smiling. So I do get smiles, even more so than some other countries, even more, more so than France, for example, or Italy. Uh, more people are more smiley in the streets. It's very fascinating. What is the main points of truth by Dr. David Hawkins, asked Anthony. Anthony's asking about a book I'm reading called Truth vs. Ha Falsehood by David Hawkins. Uh, Susie says, I'm, it's good to hear you giggle. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad. Wait until I cackle. That's, that's, when, that's when things will get wild. Uh, Anthony asks, what's the book I'm reading? Hmm. called Truth vs. Falsehood by Dr. David Hawkins. I've been really obsessed with his work. He's a therapist. Is he a therapist? I think he, he is a therapist. He is a therapist that uh, teaches about spirituality. And um, he, according to his own scientific methods, he has found a way to discern between truth and falsehood. It's very complicated. This, this conversation, even to have it, will take a long time. But in essence, he, he, uh, in the book, he gives a, a sense of what is true in this world and what is false in this world. What gives you energy and what drains you of energy. And it, it has been very deeply illuminating because... To be very brief in this, the premise of a lot of spiritual literature from anywhere around the world is that from our human perspective, we see things linearly. So time to us is linear. We are experiencing A to B to C to D. But for example, if you were to draw two lines on a paper, one point to another point. From the perspective of that point, you will just see one, one other dot. So put yourself in the flat perspective. You only see one other dot. So from our 3D perspective, we see uh, two, uh, two points connecting it with a line. So what does that say about perspective? Because according to quantum physics, according to the cutting edge science, there's 11 dimensions. And we are only experiencing three or four. It gets a little bit complicated, but we're experiencing three to four dimensions. <laughs> uh, length, width, height, and time. So what, for, how does life look from a higher dimension, a higher dimension, a higher perspective? It's not linear. All time can be seen at once. So in the perspective of our lives, we might feel like this terrible circumstance. Let's say you uh, slipped on the street. You slipped on the street, got a pretty bad fall, you got a cut up knee. From our human perspective, that might seem like a terrible day. That might seem like a terrible event. But from a higher perspective, it actually might have, for example, you scraped your knee, you missed out on going to this event. It might have prevented you from going through a very negative event, at a negative circumstance at that event. So you might have scraped your knee, but it was for something good. So that was from a higher perspective. So you think about that, <laughs> then, uh, then a lot of questions start popping up about our world. What if 
we saw certain worldly events as being very negative, but they actually have been quite a positive. This is a very hard conversation to have. Very hard. Not just in terms of the difficulty of, of verbalizing it, but also of the beliefs a lot of people already have. They're so, um, a lot of people, a majority of humans are, are very set in their beliefs. Very, 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 very set on what they think is, is right and what is wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a piece of uh, qui uh, quinoa. I inhaled. <clears throat> oh my god, I inhaled a piece of quinoa. Don't 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 inhale quinoa, ladies and gentlemen. Um so a lot of people are set on their beliefs. What is right and what is wrong. And sometimes it's hard to to have any conversation that that doesn't clash with those beliefs. How's the bottle of water in, uh, in Copenhagen? Great question. Okay, so I'm drinking right now Nordic Well. <coughs> There's not that much variety in water here in Denmark. I've only seen maybe two companies thus far. Nordic Well, and there's another one that's also blue. Not too many water companies, so... It has like a crisp taste. It has a good mouth feel. It's kind of um it, it, it kind of satiates your, your thirst. It doesn't dry out your mouth as some other waters. Like a Poland spring sometimes feels like you're drying out your mouth. Mm. Rachel says, Can you drink the tap? I think you can. I think Denmark here is the tap is safe. Do I drink tap? I don't because a lot of tap systems around the world have really old pipes and those old pipes have a lot of rust and issues with the metal content coming out. Uh, so I don't always trust uh, first coming to a country drinking uh, tap water. If I need to, I do. If I'm at a restaurant, I will. Uh, but if I had the chance to buy good, affordable bottled water from a spring, mineral, mineral water, that's not distilled or tap water, that tap water tends not to have any minerals, I tend to drink bottled water. John says, you're a smart man, never drink tap. Yeah. And think about this. A lot of people say, oh, but you're spending on water. Why are you spending money on water? Water is the most core drink in your life it's more important than anything any other liquid people spend ten dollars on a beer in new york three dollars three euro in many parts of europe here is five euro why not spend one dollar one euro here maximum two two euro on on the good water it, to me, it makes more sense to buy good water. All right, I'm going to drink this golden milk. Got some golden milk. Some turmeric latte made with bananas and rice milk and coconut milk. Bought from that market we visited earlier. Let's try it out. It's good. Oh, that has mango. Yeah, there's a, like a mango taste to this. Very strong on the mango. I can barely taste the turmeric. Hey, Bahar says, lovely shirt, Ariel. Oh, thank you so much. Kay says, turmeric latte, my favorite. I love turmeric latte. Yeah, I'm so glad you enjoy it. And it's surprisingly popular in many cities in Europe, including over there in Ireland. Also here in Denmark and in the UK, very popular to have turmeric lattes or golden lattes. How does turmeric taste? It has a bit of a kind of spicy kick to it. So it's very similar to ginger, turmeric. If you had a curry, curries are based on turmeric. 
Q&A asks, any social situations that freak you out? Yeah, it depends on the culture, but there's some cultures where people get very close to you. The, there's a word for this. I've, it's hard. I always find the time to, to remember, but um, there's a word for the, the study of, of space that we give in any social situation. There's certain cultures where people get really up close to you. I, I always find that very uncomfortable. Um, the one that sticks out the most is Chinese. Chinese culture tends to do that. Again, this is not anything about negativity. It's not right or wrong. Uh, it's just that some cultures have less personal space than others. Uh, Chinese is among the smallest of the personal spaces. Uh, Poxemics. Thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate that. Poxemics. Pro, prosemics. Do let me know how to pronounce that. Prosemics. Uh, so Chinese is among the smallest in the world. The Greek, Greek also, I think, was pretty small as well. Irish, too. Irish are pretty small, too. Not as small as uh, Chinese. Chinese get really close. Um, but Irish, pretty small. So uh, I sometimes don't like it too much uh, when someone gets too close. I also don't like some other countries get very far. <laughs> Like, I remember in Finland, like, there was very big personal space, uh, which so, it felt a little bit excessive to me. Hey, Pari Pari says, if you go back in time, will you have chosen any other job? So if I were born before the era of, of the internet, I would have worked in TV or radio because I love chatting. If I... If I were born before the era of any type of electronic entertainment, I probably would have been a writer and or a speaker. So I think, I think my life path, if TV, radio, or internet did not exist, would have been very similar to a Mark Twain or a Charles Dickens, where they write and they do a lot of talks about their writing or, or, or storytell in, in public. Angie says, yeah, I used to work in college campus and personal space was always interesting in the fall when international students showed up for the first time. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. A troubadour says, S feels, is that the name, a troubadour? Doreen says, you were made a good DJ. Yeah, Casey Kasem here, <laughs> tuning in to Radio FM. Tonight, we're going to listen to all the jazz albums from Denmark. <laughs> That's my radio voice. Or, welcome to NPR. Today, we're going to discuss Nigerian economics and its impact on black hole theories. We're going to interview people from all around the world today on NPR. <laughs> Anthony says, what about your music taste? You're listening to a little bit right now. I love jazz. This is like, this, this is like a copyright free jazz. voice. Uh, I love jazz. I listen to a lot of classical music. I love synth wave and I love like indie rock dance disco type of music. Gary says, what about a 1930s BBC voice? I don't know how they sound in the 1930s in BBC. But I know how they sound in old American newsreels. That one's a bit harder to say. The men are off to war. Today they're about to take the ship off Hoboken. <laughs> that one's a little bit harder to do, but but that's that's like the newsreel voice from from the 1920s and 30s and 40s in the U.S. Ron says, what was your last Google search? You don't want to know, Ron. 
I don't even know. I think I searched uh, Tivoli Gardens. That was something I searched. Joe says, Ariel has the face for TV, not radio. Oh, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Q&A says, in the style of Daniel Day-Lewis? You want me to do the voice of Daniel Day-Lewis and Daniel Day Plainview? In There Will Be Blood? You see, my boy, I have a straw over there, and I have a straw over here. And when I drink from my straw, I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. <laughs> that's my, uh, that's my, there will be blood impression. It was the main character uh, played by Daniel Day-Lewis. He won an Oscar for it. One of my favorite movies, really great movie. Susie says, you would have been Orson Welles starting in the radio and then doing films. I think so, yeah. I really, I really admire Orson Welles' career path. Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, started making radio. He made radio plays. He was damn good at it. And he was, he was the voice of these radio plays aside from producing them. And he went from radio and ended up getting... Um, What was Orson Welles' first film? It was only in his mid-twenties. What was Orson Welles' first film in his mid-twenties? Coming straight from radio. Well, Orson Welles <laughs> ended up making the greatest movie of all time. Uh, or at least a lot of people call it the greatest movie of all time. Citizen Kane, <laughs> straight out, like first movie ever made. I, I, I really admire that. Um, I, would, I would love to have half of the success that Orson Welles had in his first film. I haven't directed a full feature length film yet, but I do, do intend on doing so. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll get as lucky as Orson Welles. <laughs> That would be cool. Just a straight off the bat from live video on YouTube and TikToks to making some of the most, the most American classic film ever. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if that happens, you're all witness. Tamo says, what kind of films do you want to make? Epic sci-fi action films. And a cartoon film. And I want to make a love story that takes place in the multiverse. Yes. Orson Welles was brilliant. Great magician too. Oh yeah, Joe. F is for fake is probably one of the better movies about filmmaking and storytelling in general. F is for fake. Highly recommend it. I've learned a lot from that film. Ariel, you already have a captive audience. <laughs> I'm glad. Are you a screenwriter also, says John. I have penned a... I've penned one screenplay in my life thus far. Short, a short film. Which I made it, made it into one scene. I have not... Pen, uh, uh, I've I penned a novella that started as a screenplay called Retrowave. But... I really love writing. I, I've started writing already at this point 12 years ago? 13 years ago, I started writing a lot. I, wrote, read, I ran a, a blog about music and short stories for six years on Tumblr. And then later on, on a platform called Kinja. And then on Instagram, I've been writing a lot uh, for many years. And Retrowave was one of my first novellas, short, short stories that I wrote. 
And I've come to a point, and I've said this many times before, but every, every, now I feel even more and more and more uh, that itch to write a film. I'm in the point right now at this very moment in time that I'm trying to figure out how to give my best in live video and in, um, in TikToks while having time to write. I've never been the best multitasker. I like really focusing on one thing at a time in the past many years, past six years already, I've only focused really on my work here on Urbanist. Uh, of course, I made albums and uh, <laughs> things like that, but it's all been for Urbanist. Uh, so I got to, I'm trying to figure out how I can do both. Or do I need to do both? Should I do both? I don't know. Uh, so... This trip, I kind of planned it to write, but at the same time, there's so much time I need to spend on like finding SIM cards, sometimes researching, it depends on the city, um, getting to know the city either through research or experientially by wandering around. It's a lot of time. And then making TikToks, it requires editing. Those are the short videos on Facebook as well. Um, it requires editing and editing you, you it might be a it might look like a simple three minute video but those edits especially the more elaborate ones sometimes take hours so it's a whole lot of work and i gotta get to the places because my entire my entire work online is about places like i go to places uh i don't like doing stuff where i'm sitting down like here, like I, I'm sitting down here, it's nice, but the majority of my content is going to a place. So it's a lot of work and I, I want to find a way that I can free my time more so I can write. Nina says, you thrive on instant commentary. I do. Don't think you ever write so, you, you should ever write solely. Yeah, I thrive on uh, on the conversation. I even the book I wrote, Retrowave, was written as very dialogue based. I thrive on conversation. Oh yes, I do. That sounds like you might need an assistant, says Tevani. I think I think I do. I think I do. Joe says Ariel's impressive. He's his own production company. That is facts. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, sometimes people don't realize that there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. And you know what? It's not to... It's not to toot one's horn. But... Right now, we're living in a world where we're getting so much entertainment. Tons of entertainment. Countless videos you have access to on YouTube, on, on TikTok, on Facebook, on Netflix, on Amazon Prime, on Disney Plus, in the movie theaters. Someone asked me about Top Gun Maverick. I loved it. Amazing film. There is countless entertainment. And if you're not in the field of entertainment... To the viewer, it might seem like all of this is rather effortless. It, it might seem like this is rather easy. And if someone talks about how they're struggling in making it, then you can just tune out and go to a different channel. So... So with this glutton... How do you say the word? There's a better. There's a way to say glutton in a way that's uh, a noun, but a uh, glut. With all this glut of entertainment, we take it for granted, and this is what causes a lot of content creators, specifically the ones that are not working in a set structure like Marvel films, 
like uh, the Hollywood system, they already set, they already made a, a system, they already made systems, structures to guarantee that the machine keeps on running without anyone getting too tired out. But that doesn't exist for content creators. Content creators tend to be either solo or they might get bigger and they have a team. But there's, no, there's not that many systems yet. So especially if you're solo, you don't know how to quite balance the different aspects. Uh, there is a lot of work involved. And um, unfortunately, a lot of content creators <clears throat> burn out because... A, the audience doesn't quite understand the work that goes involved, so uh, the, the work that goes into it, so there's less investment in the content. And yeah, you can blame the actual piece of entertainment saying, oh, it's not so entertaining en enough for me to keep on tuning in. But also there's this aspect of if a content creator just falters slightly or the quality slightly goes down because they're, they might be, you know, taking a little, the work is catching up to them. So they don't have too much time to do all the work. Uh, people just tune out. They never come back. And that kind of sucks. And that's why content creators burn out. So I think it's very important to, to emphasize that this is work. Uh, it, it, just like a painting, just like engineering, just like a, a doctor, just like a, a musician, just like a farmer, just like a barista, just like a restaurateur, any job, any job, entertainment is a job just like any other. And, um, and it requires a lot of work. Uh, some fields of entertainment requires more the work is not so physical. You know, a doctor has to work in learning all the aspects of human anatomy, so that's why their college career is long, their education is long. And then they actually, if you're a, a, a surgeon, you're actually working and doing surgery. So it's physical. Uh, not always with entertainers is it always physical. So part of the live video process is I have to be fairly present and happy and relaxed in my own life in order to give you the best entertainment. Because if I'm tired out, if I am exhausted, if I have stuff that I'm struggling in my own life, it, it, it gets hard to give the most on camera. And in a way, I think that's why some television hosts are paid the big bucks. Actors are paid the big bucks because they, they end up providing entertainment that goes to millions, if not more, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. Um, and they can't do that if, if they're living a, a hard life. <laughs> it's, it gets a lot difficult. Uh, so they... They get to be paid well. An actor is paid so well that they can generally live a pretty calm life aside from the dangers of fame. Aside from that, they can live a pretty calm life, pretty comfortable life. And some of them do a good job of giving great entertainment uh, with all that money that they receive. So, like every time you see George Clooney, George Clooney's paid a bunch. And he, he definitely makes money other ways, but he's paid a bunch in his own movies. But every time you see George Clooney on screen, he shines. He's amazing. And I think uh, that that's the part of entertainment that also kind of people, uh, a lot, the general public may, may not uh, fully grasp that something interesting. Adam, thank you so much for tuning in. You need someone for all the administrative stuff, says uh, Nicole. I think I do. I just, you know, even, even learning how to manage someone is, is work. <laughs> Yeah, of course I'm I'm willing to do the work, but it's work. <laughs> it's work nonetheless. You know, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to hire people because, as I mentioned, with uh, trying to work with a camera person, it's hard to get a camera person. Uh, there's, there's some people who out there who, if if I want to not spend too much money. 
I would have to hire someone not so experienced. And that requires a whole lot of teaching, a whole lot of uh, training. And then if I were to hire someone who is experienced, they might be a little bit too set on their ways. So I'm spending a lot of money for not too much flexibility. Uh, so I, I've struggled with uh, kind of even hiring someone for like videos. But I would love to figure it out. A few of my friends have figured it out. Hey, Mir says, how have you been looking back to your starting point of the world exploration? Do you remember a different you? Do you feel adventure has changed you? Ooh. Hey, Susie says, I could have a go on typing. Do you, do you have a typewriter? We have had a few great questions. Let me answer the first uh, question about changing. Mir asked a question, have I changed? Um, yeah, I think I have. You see my travels on, on Urbanist, and I've learned a lot about history. I've learned a lot about different cultures, which has illuminated about my own cultural quirks. You know, I grew up in a Puerto Rican family, raised in New York, so obviously I grew up with those cultures. And as I mentioned with like the smiliness, uh, I've learned about those uh, that kind of tendencies that one does almost unconsciously. So it has been very illuminating. A lot of people are saying goodbye. <laughs> Where's everyone going? Uh, Wendy says, good to see you. Hey, Wendy, nice to see you. Um, so, so yes. Did the live stream like crash? Are people still here? Let me know. So yeah, the trouble has changed me in those regards. And then the other regard it has changed me, it has made me learn that I can do a lot of stuff on my own. It's been a, a, a good pleasure to travel solo because I've learned that I can do a lot of things on my own. I can figure out the trains in the country I don't know the language. I can figure out... Um, how to go to a restaurant if I don't know the language or the cultural nuances. And it's nice to know that you can work your way around the world and not just in your own bubble. It's nice. ABX girl, thank you so much for tuning in. So Susie asked, do you need, uh, do you have a typewriter? Do you need a typewriter? <clears throat> so, um, Isabel says, still here with you. Oh, thank you so much for tuning in, Isabel. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in. Um, <clears throat> do I need a typewriter? Yeah, so... What's her name? I'm trying to think about the writer's name. So, they're, they're the famous writer, I think her first name is Bree? Um... She ended up becoming very famous due to a TED Talk. And she is a psychologist. And uh, she has become an international sensation since that TED Talk. And writing a few books. If anyone knows who I'm talking about, do let me know the name in the comments. So, this writer... And not writer. This is she. She. She's a psychologist who did a TED talk. So uh, she had some great theories. Brie Larson. No, not that. That Brie Larson is the actress. Uh, it's a. It's another woman. Um, she ended up making this this uh, TED talk that ended up becoming a massive hit. Uh, Brene Brown. Thank you so much, Fawn. Brene Brown is her name. Brene Brown. So Brene Brown. Massive hit with uh, TED Talk. Tens of millions of views. End up getting a lot of speaking gigs from it and a lot of book deals. Thing is, Brene Brown end up confiding in the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Remind me of her name. Uh, what's that woman's name again? Eat, Pray, Love writer. She ended up confiding in that writer. 
saying, hey, hey uh, do you have any advice for writing? Because I don't know what to do. I don't like sitting down at the typewriter and writing. Uh, I find it so tedious. Uh, but obviously, she felt like she had enough stuff to write about. So, Elizabeth Gilbert is her name. Elizabeth Gilbert, writer of E Pray Love, uh, tells her, So, when, when do those ideas come to you? How, how do you say them? Like, uh, how, uh, how, when do the ideas flow the best? And Brene Brown uh, said it, obviously, like, yeah, when I was on stage, they all came flowing. And uh, when I'm at the office, I have my assistant um, write the outlines for what I'm going to end up writing for the book. But when the moment I start uh, sitting down to write the book, I get stuck. And Elizabeth Colbert tells her, why don't you just get your assistant to write the book? <laughs> Just you dictate it, like if you were doing a TED Talk. And Brene Brown decided to give it a shot. So she goes, and she starts dictating the book to her assistant. She might, and she was blown away when she comes back to Elizabeth Gilbert said, Oh my God, <laughs> I'm basically done with the book because I wrote it so, or wrote it. She, she wrote it in essence because she was dictating. But she wrote the book uh, so fast uh, because she did it in that style. It was super easy. And then she ended up working with uh, someone who was a little bit better at editing and everything. And what she would start to do is actually dictate it on tape and the person would write the transcript. And that book came out and ended up becoming an international bestseller. And then Brene Brown now has like four or five international bestsellers. That's how she writes her books. And that was really eye-opening. Because I thought to myself, oh, wow. That's how I wrote my first screenplay. I, wrote, I co-wrote it with a friend of mine. And the way we co-wrote, she was very good at the laptop. And she was the one typing away. And there were certain many scenes in that screenplay where I just dictated them. And uh, I loved writing like that. I, I started writing with another friend like that as well. It was so much fun. So, so yes. <laughs> I kind of do want uh, someone to, to write things down that I say. I think it will be a lot easier way for me to write because I'm way better spoken than, than sitting down and writing away. Wendy says, hypnotize me so I can marry you. <laughs> hey, Roy says, note to self, hire an assistant. Yes. If I, I, I feel like if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, in the way you do, Susie. I mean, nothing in this world is done alone. And even solo jobs aren't really done alone. Even Beethoven needed someone to tune his piano. Even Mozart needed someone to tune his piano, to build his piano. We never truly work alone in our world. Even the writer needs other writers to write books about the research that they have to do. Very few writers are making books completely out of thin air. Every writer really reads at some point something or experiences something. So like a Neil Gaiman, he writes a lot of things that involved uh, mythology. So obviously he has to read books about mythology. He ain't working alone. No one really ever is working alone. This is a great way to keep the flow, says Joe. Yeah, there are computer programs that I type what you say, says uh, David. Yeah, it's a bit better when there's a human 
But I, I, I do know what you mean. Those could be good. Better than nothing, of course. Hey, Dolores, I'm so glad you, you, you told us how you change in your travels. Nice that you spoke about some of your vulnerabilities while traveling. Uh, e eating alone, travel. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's important to do that because... Traveling solo is not easy. A lot, uh, it's not, not that it's not easy, but it's, um, a lot of people don't do it. A lot of people are afraid to do it. So I think, I think it's better to give people a well-rounded perspective on, on, uh, on the vulnerabilities of travel. Isabel says she give a, she gave a cameo in Netflix Wine Country. That's amazing. Ah, DS, DS, see, DS is asking a question in good faith. Thank you so much. DS says, do you think you're too, too controlling or, or uh, for assistant or sidekick? It's a legit question. Um, I am not. I'm a bit of the opposite. That, I think that's been my struggle is I don't like dictating everything. And I've encountered a lot of people I've tried working with who need dictation on everything. How to move the camera, where to move the camera, uh, what to say, how to say it, uh, how to edit, where to edit. It, it, yeah, I've encountered a lot of that. I don't like doing that. I like people who, who can make their own decisions, not just... Technically, but artistically too. So that's why I mean when uh, hiring a cameraman, a camera person, uh, I would love to have a camera person that can act as a co-host but can make their own decisions. Uh, I remember working with a camera person before. I told them, move the camera any way you would like. And um, they, they did not the camera was stuck on me the entire time. <laughs> and that is, it's not, not necessarily laziness. It's just, it's a lack of artistry. And I don't want to dictate the artistry to someone else. So I am not like a Stanley Kubrick who dictates, or a James Cameron who would dictate every single element. Uh, there's another filmmaker out there Who's controversial for his own personal life? Well, I'm talking about filmmaking. Uh, Woody Allen. Uh, Woody Allen, the way he films, um, he has a, a script, but he tells the actors, read the lines whatever way you want to read them. Change the script if you want to. He tells that to his actors. A lot of actors have, have said that they're freaked out working with him because it's too much freedom. And for a filmmaker like him, and there's other filmmakers like him, but that's the example that pops into my head, he, it, it can, it sometimes works really well, and sometimes it sucks. He's made a movie a year. Some of them are timeless classics. Some of them are complete flops, and it's because of that freedom. Some people can, can't handle it. Uh, some actors f f uh, completely falter at having that much freedom. Uh, so that, that, I think that, that's, that's, that's where I kind of struggle uh, trying to hire people out. Though it worked out for me in the soundtracks. Uh, when I made the music, I told the people, this is what I'm inspired by. This is the type of sound I would like. And then later on, when I made a few songs, use parts of this song, use that part of that song, and make something new out of it based on this, this, and that. And I let them have their own creative freedom. The majority of the people who I worked with, uh, with the soundtracks, with the musics that I made, they did an excellent job. 
the need to oversight, the need to give them too much input. But for example, uh, I got I hired someone to do one of the artworks for the album, and they wanted exhaustive detail, that had to cancel that job. I couldn't work with them because they just they just they did not they weren't taking any initiative to do something themselves. They wanted everything to be dictated, and I was like, I can't. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you how to draw it. Uh, another guy, another guy who works like that is. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a guy who really knew what he wanted, but at the same time, he wanted you to do it on your own way and do it efficiently. And that freaked a lot of people out because it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, Steve Jobs did not dictate how you would do something, but he expected you to do it and do it with a lot of artistry. Tammany says, you're not a micromanager. Those are the worst. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Wendy says, you're unique. Oh, Diaz says, makes sense. Larry says, looking for a job. Help me. Sorry, Larry, I can't. Pro tip, YouTube has... Infinite resources about working, about learning how to do your own work, about freelancing, about finances. I get, I, I, I have had people in my life struggle with something, anything. And I tell them, go on YouTube. Some of them do. And it makes a big difference in their lives. Some of them don't. And they continue to struggle. Often to make any change in our lives takes a little bit of initiative. Not hard work is not the best way of thinking about it. In the beginning or maybe in certain points of your life, yes, you will need to grind a bit. But what is more powerful is to unleash your curiosity to learn and then by learning you can apply those learnings so if you're struggling in anything any part of your life maybe trying to find a job maybe trying to find a career maybe learning a new language maybe moving to a new place Maybe something in your family, uh, maybe some emotional issues, maybe this, that, that, the list goes on. There's videos about all of it. All of it. So many videos. You could literally learn about anything on YouTube. And it's free <laughs> for the majority of people all around the world. If you have access to the internet, be immensely grateful for the amazing access you have to all the world's knowledge. Not all of those videos are going to be always helpful. They might, some of them might outright lead you to the wrong direction. So that takes discernment. But you have all of it. Use it. Doreen says you're already there. You found your niche. That is uh, great to know on YouTube, but the hardest part is executing ideas, says John. You can find videos about execution. <laughs> about executing ideas. You can find videos about how to execute a project. Oh, yes. You can find videos about every single aspect of making a project and bringing it out into fruition. The problem is not the execution of the project. The problem is your desire to act upon making it happen. As I mentioned, it's not always about hard work. It's about just doing something, showing up. Ella says, I learned how to take my dishwasher apart and fix it. Yes, let us know. What have you learned on YouTube? Let us know in the comments. 
<laughs> David says, if you Google execution ideas, <laughs> it might probably lead you to some interesting things. Yes, do not search that up. <laughs> and do not do that in the dark web, please. Gary says, first YouTube video I've ever learned was about elephants. Um, DS says, what do you think people for leaving their comfort zone? I am very much in the belief of path of the least resistance. It's a very Taoist philosophy. The Taoists are um, basically one of the major religions from China. The point of taking the path of least resistance is that you flow better in life. It's not too hard. It's not too still. It's, you're just flowing. It's good to flow. So, when it comes to coming out of your comfort zone, do it with the path of least resistance. Ask yourself, whatever that is, it's going to be different for everyone. But what was the path of least resistance to me? Six years ago, I wanted to do videos. I wanted anything, everything to just make something that was filmed. And I tried a bunch of things. I did a short film, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that one did not amount to too much, but it was a nice experience. Um, and I tried vlogging. Vlogging really pushed me in the comfort zone and it was really uncomfortable. I did not like vlogging too much. And the moment that I did a live video and I saw those comments pop up, I said, oh, this is the way I'm going to vlog. This is the way I'm going to make a film. I didn't feel so comfortable jumping off the deep end six years ago to, to write a, a feature-length screenplay, try to gather friends and, and, and financing to make a movie. Of course, there are people who've done that. But it wasn't for me at that moment. It was a bit too out of my comfort zone. Vlogging was a bit too out of my comfort zone. Trying to talk in public to a big DSLR camera because at that time to vlog, good quality, you had to use a big camera. It was out of my comfort zone. And I didn't want to push myself too much. I could have. I could have grinded through it. I could have hard work, you know, I could have grinded, I could have, have pushed myself. But why go through that type of turmoil in your life when there's always an easier path? And to me, the easiest path was doing live video. It was something that made my job a lot more fun. It made making films a lot more fun at that moment in time. And since then, I've made soundtracks, I've made vlogs, I've edited vlogs, I've made a documentary, I've made a mini documentary that's on display in the museum. I've done many things because I pushed my comfort zone in a way that was comfortable that's the way to push the comfort zone is to do it comfortably and once you do that a lot more opportunities are going to pop up so for example, if it's traveling solo and to you to to the person to anyone who who might be out there if traveling solo is out of your comfort zone 
some of you might be easy to visit your friend in Paris, if you have a friend in Paris. That might be the easiest way to just get out there and just travel on your own. You're not, you're, you won't be traveling fully alone because you'll be meeting up with your friend or a family member. But that's a, that's a good step. It's an easy step. If you don't have a family member, if you don't have a friend or something like that, the situation is going to be different for everyone. But another example is if, if traveling solo is way out of your comfort zone, go to your nearest city. Stay there for a night or two. Stay there for a weekend. Explore that nearby city on your own. Don't go with a friend. Don't go with a family member. Go on your own. That way you can ease into it. Wendy says, I have family in Bermuda. Yeah, that's, that's an easy way of doing it. Just go to Bermuda on your own. Go to Bermuda. YouTube actually helped me overcome a fear of flying before getting on a plane for the first time, says Flying Squirrel. Yeah, that's right, Flying Squirrel. I'm glad, I'm glad that's the case. Congrats to you. That's awesome to hear. Warner says, can we interview Ariel? I mean, you already are in essence. You've been my top 80, 8 uh, YouTubers for like two years. Is it interesting to ha hear how hard it was you for, for you to break the threshold of live? Yeah, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be among your top YouTubers. Uh, that's honored. I'm honored to hear that. Ray says, will you visit the Little Mermaid? Yes, I think I will. Probably be a short video. I have deja vu now. <laughs> About the Little Mermaid in, in Copenhagen. Um, Gary says, where I work or soon not to work. They force everyone to do stuff with, uh, with their comfort zones. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. That's the case with corporate culture. Sometimes they just like have, they push you. Um, Susie says, I don't like coming out of my comfort zone. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, if you don't want to, no worries at all. Kristen says, it's brilliant. I'm an artist, but I have learned new techniques from other painters, kindly shared throughout the years of experience. Yes. That's awesome, Kristen. Ariel, you're the best, says Samuel. Thanks for continuing these philosophical chats. My pleasure. I'll stick around for, for about 20 more minutes. Feel free to ask me anything. Let's round it up to two hours. Nina says, YouTube didn't help me with a bro broken cork in the bottle of sparkling wine. Hmm. Or the bartender I dated. Nina, I bet there's a video out there about uncorking a bottle of wine with a broken cork. Susie says, what question would you not like to have be asked? Um, if I get it, I won't, I won't answer it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I am a public figure, so I don't answer too many questions that are personal details of my life and exact locations, so... As a public figure, I don't answer those questions. Susie says his age. Yeah, you know, there'll come a point where if, if I get any more known, uh, my age will have to, will be known. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm playing, I'm learning day by day how to, to be a public figure. Gary says, probably your PIN card for your PIN number for your credit card. Yeah, I wouldn't share that. I also don't like. Sometimes people ask questions. 
that come off as insults. And those always, in my opinion, kind of suck. They, they generally come from a place of naivety. But some questions tend to be very loaded. And it's not so nice receiving those questions. So, so those are the type of questions I tend to not enjoy when someone's trying to insinuate something, but they're making it seem like an innocent question. It's a bit annoying because, A, why are you even trying to insinuate? Just be straightforward. If you're asking another question, just be straightforward. I've learned to, to stop doing the same thing. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone's guilty of doing that. At some point in their lives. But yes, those, those questions kind of suck. When someone's trying to insinuate something, trying to ask you a different question, but they mask it as some type of innocent question. That ha- that, when it comes to older people, that happens with, um, with the shirts I wear. I think because people from a different generation ha- had a different set of values or a different set of beliefs. So it's only natural, but I've gotten some questions from uh, especially older individuals saying, why, why do you wear flowers? (laughs) I know you're asking something else. Just ask it. (laughs) Uh, Elizabeth says some people are on the spectrum. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that is the case. Yes, That, that, that is understandable. That is understandable. Rohan says, do you have a question for your audience? You know, that is a, I ask questions better when it comes to, yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific question right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ron. <laughs> I'm glad everyone's tuned in, but at the moment, no, I don't have a specific question. I'm so sorry. Uh, Werner says they mustn't come from, for the shirts. <laughs> Hey, Alexandria, nice to see you here. Welcome. Flying Squirrel says, what U.S. city do you really want to visit? I've joked about it, but I'm very curious what's in Lincoln, Nebraska. I just want to know. There's probably not much, but I want to know. I want to live stream. At Lincoln, Nebraska, one day, it'll shock a lot of people to be like, you actually went there? <laughs> I'm just curious, what's in Lincoln, Nebraska? I don't know, that, that's one U.S. city I would love to go to. I would love to live stream in Las Vegas at least once, uh, at least for like a week. Uh, I, would, uh, I would want to go to... I'm curious about Dallas, Texas, because they've been building Metro. And where would I want to go? Yeah, pretty much that. I'm not so deeply interested in in the U.S. Uh, Again, as I mentioned many times, I love my country. But uh, at this moment in my life, I'm not really that interested in visiting many places in the U.S., Susie says, I'm very worried you're not going to have enough to eat tomorrow. Oh, I will, I will Susie. I'm exaggerating. That. Yes, I can, I can afford a, a bite to eat. Hot dogs are only $10. <laughs> yes, Susie, I'll be able to eat. I have enough food here. I have, I have, I have this bread, Susie. I have this bread. Mmm. Bread. I think there's oil here. Yeah, there, I got some bread and oil, Susie. Don't worry. Ella says, uh, Alaska. Yeah, I think Alaska would be cool. Mmm, that was so good. Street view can neutralize all questions raised by inspecting maps. I think. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but... Yeah, Street View is interesting. Street View, some things are blurred. 
uh, street, uh, Google had an issue doing uh, Google Earth satellite view in Denmark because a lot of Danes had the tendency to sunbathe on, on their rooftops or on their balconies completely naked. We witnessed that yesterday in the jazz boat. There was a woman completely naked on one of the boats. Um, so Google had the awkward uh, position where they had to blur naked Danes on their rooftops during hot summer days when they were trying to do the satellite view photos. What about San Francisco? Oh, yeah. I heard about so much crime in San Francisco, so it, it has turned me off, but I would love to go to San Francisco. Monkey, get, your, get yourself a pet monkey with a fez that puts it out to passersby to get some of those changes. This is Gary. <laughs> I'm a rich man in the U.S. Well, I'm not, I'm not, not, I'm not like rich, but <laughs> uh, here in, De in Denmark, it can make any rich man feel feel poor. <laughs> Elizabeth says your slight or your your slightest aversion to beach. It would be fun to see you actually swim in in world of water. Um. Not that I have a aversion to beaches. I just find them rather boring. It's not quite a aversion. I just find them boring. Um, when I did that Scotland trip for a week, there was one day that was dedicated to beaches. I was I, I had to drink like five coffees to even stay awake. It was it. Was, there were beautiful places, but I was so bored. <laughs> No offense to the tour guy, he did a great job. But yeah, I'm personally not so interested in beaches. I find them so boring. To chill, maybe with a significant other in a beach would be fun. Or or like on a family uh, hangout. But generally, I, I, maybe with a big group, group of friends, a beach is Wendy says, here, here for you for a few months, but uh, here with you uh, every time. Well, for at least a few months. Oh, no, Wendy. What's that going to happen for a few months? Um, Kay says, I can only last on the beach for about 30 minutes and I get bored. Yeah, no. Is there a country that you have visited that would, you would never want to visit again? That's a good question. I've had the pleasure of visiting very nice places. I'm not super keen on going back to Madrid. I think every, uh, a lot of people who've seen my show already know uh, I'm not super fond of Madrid, Spain. Yeah, I haven't visited a place where I really disliked it. R Bucharest, Romania was a bit, there was a, a little bit of a, it was a bit sad, a lot of the history in Romania, um, and a lot of people, a lot of the people there weren't really that proud of their own city, um, so it, it, it didn't make visiting it that deep of a pleasure, because every, uh, a lot of people, Almost everyone I met in Romania had a very negative opinion about Romania. Though, to me, initially, Bucharest seemed like a really nice city. Uh, so that, that kind of uh, bummed me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much those are the only two places that I probably wouldn't go back. Nah, at least not in the, in the near future. Why not Madrid, says Siguenas? I don't know. I just had weird experiences. I got so many weird looks doing live video. I got a lot of people, especially older people, doing this kind of protection symbol. In America, this would mean like loser, but it's like a Catholic protection symbol. They were doing this when they saw me with the camera. It was so weird. Uh, so there was some type of superstition with cameras, at least with the older generation. And then... Um, 
I, I went in February, so this might be the time of year, but the entire city felt very kind of slow paced. There was a bit of a sluggish feeling with the culture there. At least that's what I experienced. So maybe, um, maybe it was just a, not the best first impression. That would be a good book for you to write. Visit these countries instead, says Werner. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the one place I really want to return is, is Helsinki. I would want. I didn't think I, I don't think I've really explored all that I could from Helsinki. And um, I want to go back. I want to go back to the UK. I love, I love the UK. I want to go back to Ireland. That's for sure. And um, France too. And I want to go see more Greek islands. Oh, Gain. Gain As have you done Hawaii? Hawaii is on my top list. So I would say Hawaii, top, 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 top place I really want to visit in the U.S. Crazy Syrup Guy says, I want to return to Spain to hang out with your girlfriend. Oh, yeah, I hope you do. You know, uh, it's also very subjective uh, whether a place is nice or not. Sh there, Sure, there are places in the world where... More objectively, would not I would not advise people to travel to. Hmm, I'm not sure. I I don't think I've really encountered many of those places. Luckily, yeah, I haven't encountered really those places. But I would assume I would I may encounter or could encounter. Places around the world where I would say more objectively, no, I don't recommend co coming here. Um, but when it comes to liking a city or not really liking a city, it's very subjective. Uh, H. Flores says, go to Toledo, Segovia, and Sevilla instead. Yes. Yes, well, Spain is a very multicultural country like the UK, so I will give Spain a second chance, especially maybe the, those other cultures of Barcelona and Sevilla and the south of Spain and Andalusia. Yeah. And for Sandez says, thank you so much for the chat. My pleasure. All right, everyone, I'm sticking around for seven more minutes. Feel free to ask me anything. Olga says, yes. What about Disneyland? Just for history, says Gain Life. Yeah, I think I would, for, for making a video about history, I think I will go to Disneyland at least once in my life and do a video about it. Werner says, judge cities by their postcards. There are some cities that are amazing, what I call now postcard cities. There are great postcard cities out there. Not all of them are created equal. New York is one of the most fabulous cities to visit in the world. They kind of suck with postcards. There's a very limited amount of postcards. Seattle, as I mentioned, Seattle is a very beautiful city. It's not the most engaging, fascinating. It is a very beautiful city. But Seattle has been one of the top postcard cities I've ever been to. The postcards available in Seattle were so unique and varied and interesting. Oh, that was a great postcard city. Paris is both a great city to visit and also a great postcard city. There's a few cities out there that are great postcard cities. Ireland, too, was another one. Had great postcards. Uh, Chicago sucked. Had almost zero postcards. <laughs> it was a fine city. But the postcards just sucked. It was a terrible postcard city. When is the Urbanist Cafe opening? You know, funnily enough, there's, a, er, there's an Urbanist Cafe in Bucharest, Romania. Which I did not manage to visit when I went to Romania. Um, but I would love to open up an Urbanist Cafe at some point. 
Live stream in Wyoming. Maybe one day I will. Go Cheyenne Mountain. Maybe I'll get permission from uh, the American military to do a inside tour of the underground bunker military base in Cheyenne Mountain, Wyoming. Sil says, uh, Seattle's very artsy. What country would you say is more artsy? Seattle is indeed very artsy. Um, what country is more artsy? I mean, New York is already more uh, very artsy. Maybe it might not have the best postcards, but it has amazing art. Uh, Paris is pretty artsy. I would say Bristol, England was very artsy. I featured it like for two days. A few years ago. Aria says, come to Malta. Let me mute this. Yeah, I would love to go to Malta. Is building Legos and not building a problem? Says a uh, very sorty, soroti, soroto. Uh, very soroto says, is building Lego and not building a problem or that society has, or is it just me? Uh, when I built Legos, I did finish my Legos. So it might just be you. <laughs> building Legos are a lot of fun. KM says, I find beaches boring. I spent time in Costa Rica and Panama. Have you been there? No, I haven't been to Central America. Not yet. Uh, so people have asked me where I go to Africa. At the moment, I don't have interest in Africa. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm sure there's a lot of lovely aspects of a Africa. But at the moment, I'm personally not keen on going. Um, but I am keen on going to South America. Central America, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Panama City. Maybe a part of Costa Rica. But I'm very keen on South America. I would love to go to... Lima, Peru, Cusco, um, I would love to go to Buenos Aires, Santiago, Chile, uh, maybe some more, uh, some of Jake says, have you been to Texas? Not yet, but I, I'm now more and more keen to check out Texas. And... Uh, David says, do you recommend the Airbnb if you want to stay in the city for three weeks? Yes. Airbnb, for a very long stays, I would recommend Airbnb. Especially if it's more than a week. Week or less, it's very comfortable staying in a hotel if you can afford it. It depends on the city. Sometimes, uh, some cities, the hotel is a lot cheaper than Airbnb. But... If you're staying for more than a week, Airbnb might be more comfortable. It will be more affordable, that's for sure, because there's good discounts on Airbnbs that are longer than a week or multiple weeks. Uh, but uh, you'll also be in the neighborhood generally in many cities around the world. You'll be in the neighborhood where there will be more stuff happening or you'll have the choice to be in the neighborhood where more stuff is happening. Problem is with hotels is that sometimes they are in neighborhoods where things get a little bit boring at night. Uh, depends on the city, of course. So yeah, I think Airbnb. And it's also nice having a kitchen in case you need it. It's nice having a washer dryer. Many Airbnbs or you can check if they have them, and they're generally more spacious. So it's nice for an extended stay. Did I stay in an Airbnb in Boston, says Armchair Guru. I did stay in an Airbnb. I stayed what? Airbnb, there's some Airbnbs which are kind of professional Airbnbs. That means that they their entire business is running Airbnbs. So it wasn't someone's home like I am at right now. 
Uh, right now, for this lodging, I won't be showing it on the video because it's someone's private home. So I don't want to uh, in, uh, invade on their privacy. But um, in Boston, I did stay in the Airbnb. It was very cheap when I went because it was right during the pandemic. And I stayed right at Beacon Hill, which is the richest neighborhood in all of America. And somehow I will only spend $79 a night. <laughs> it was awesome. Do you find them clean? Yes, the majority of Airbnbs are clean. You can always check the reviews. I don't stay at Airbnbs that don't have reviews, unless if I'm really desperate. Uh, so it, I generally stay in Airbnbs with a, a bunch of good reviews. You can gauge whether it's going to be clean. I have not had an instance where it was unclean. There was one Airbnb in Greece, in Athens, that was great by all means, but unfortunately had a few cockroaches. Kind of sucked. <laughs> I had to, I had to uh, uh, sm uh, squash a few cockroaches. Um, that kind of sucked because the, the, all, the rest of the Airbnb was just amazing. It was a great Airbnb. It, I think it was not really fully in control of the Airbnb owner because that sometimes is more of a building issue. Are the Airbnb owners away now, says Susie? No, yeah, so the Airbnb I'm staying at is not shared with the owner. So the owner is not living on premise. Um, and then in Paris, the owner was also not living on premise. It, it, in the case with Paris, that was the full-time home of someone. They just went away while I stayed in their home. In the case of here, the person, this is the person's home. They just use this more as a second apartment. So this is not their full-time house. So they themselves already have another place here in Copenhagen. Kay says, I'll run a mile if I saw a cockroach. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in Greece, it was very funny because uh, there was a big cockroach. And luckily, I've, ha I've had the good opportunity where I've rarely encountered this in my life. But I had to squash a cockroach. And I ended up getting the biggest book I can that was available in this Airbnb. Because this Airbnb really wasn't like a full home. It was just designed to be an Airbnb. But luckily, they had a few books. So I grabbed the best book I could and just took it and whacked it. And I look at the book and the squashed cockroach. And the book was the Eastern Orthodox Bible. <laughs> so you could say I smited that cockroach. Ambrose says, is that why hotel rooms have Bibles? Maybe, maybe that's the reason. Don't go to Hawaii if you don't like large cockroaches. Yeah, you know, some, some places more than others, you just have to deal with it. You know, some countries you have to deal with mosquitoes, uh, Puerto Rico, um, parts of Paris, uh, parts of New York, depending where you're staying. You have to deal with mosquitoes. It depends on the place. Uh, yeah, fortunately, some, some places you have to deal with other creatures like the cockroach. Will you ever stay in Airbnb with the owner there? I only did once, David. It was very awkward because it was in Milan and this was way before I ever started live videos. And I rented out an Airbnb that was listed as the entire home. So I said entire home. Airbnb, there's a category that you can choose, choose the entire home, meaning that you're gonna stay in a place that you'll be in it. You'll be the only one in it. There won't be the owner or you. there won't be another room rented out to someone else. So this Airbnb, I, I rented it out thinking I was going to stay in this entire place. I was there with a fr I was traveling with a friend. And when we get there, the couple who's renting out the Airbnb greets us. And we end up finding out it's their home. And... We're just staying in the room, in their home. They were very nice. Something was lost in translation. This was about seven years ago. Um, so Airbnb was still fairly new. 
So, and they were Italian. So maybe they mistakenly miscategorized the Airbnb. The reviews were mostly Italian, so I think something was lost in translation. So there were good reviews, but I think they miscategorized it by mistake. I, I, at least I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. And uh, yeah, it was very awkward when I got there. I was like, uh, I didn't say anything. I should have said something, but I didn't say anything at that moment. Uh, they were very nice. They brought wine. They had like a cheese board. So they were very hospitable. And that made me kind of not worry too much about that miscommunication. And the stay was very accommodating and very nice. But yes, only once in my life I actually stayed in a, someone's home. I don't like it too much. I'd rather stay on my own. Or, you know, if I'm with a friend, I'd rather stay in an apartment that's the entire home. Or a hotel room. I don't like hostels too much. I don't like sharing a room with strangers. It's something I prefer not to do. If you have to do it, you have to do it. If you want to do it, that's awesome. Um, but I prefer not to. Do you have to do the dishes? Yes, Susie, here, of course I have to do the dishes. And some Airbnbs, I have to water the plants. So in this case, I have to water the plants. <laughs> There's a lot of plants here. Uh, and then the Paris one also had a lot of plants. So I have to uh, water them. It's probably the only thing I have to do. Uh, the Paris one, they, the, the person asked for me to clear out the garbage. Uh, this one, the person told me, you don't really need to clear out the garbage. You can leave it here. I'll do it. Uh, so it was very nice. Anthony says, something, something just zoomed into my room. Oh no, Anthony. And I'm getting a, a flying bug coming into your room. Some said pri private bathroom and bedroom, says Susie. Yeah, sometimes it's just a bedroom with an in-suite bathroom, which means a private bathroom. Sometimes that's the case. If you're staying in an Airbnb that's actually a traditional B&B, &B, that might be the case. Plants clean the air, says Susan. Yes, they do. Yeah, very clean air. <laughs> I have... I, I have to put this to the test because I, 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 I don't really notice the difference between plants or no plants. Maybe I gotta like stay in a plant-filled apartment for a few weeks. Oh, is, is the plants that need a lot of light and heat? I don't think so. I don't think so. They're pretty much house plants. Susie says, but many hostels you share a bathroom. You do, yes. So generally, Airbnb is very accurate. I just had one instance in the past seven years where there was a miscategorization. Do you ever sweep the room for cameras? Ask Q&A. I never felt like I had to do so. There was only one Airbnb. Only one Airbnb. I forgot which one where I felt like I needed to check if there were cameras um, because it, I'm not sure why I felt the need. I just got an intuition that I had to check for cameras. But um, no, no, generally, generally it's okay. Um, generally you don't need to do that. You'll kind of get the sense if an Airbnb is shady to have cameras in the apartment, you'll kind of get the sense in the reviews Again, it's something sometimes you might feel uh, rather than know. Um, so sometimes Airbnb owners might put a camera in front of the apartment, in front of their house. And I knew one who was very kind who, did, who does that. Uh, and she told me why she does that. And it was because it, it, this was in a place... Uh, that is in this. This was in a city where there's a lot of partying that goes on, and a lot of people hold house parties. So, she she told me that the reason she puts a camera in the front, not outside, not inside, in the front of the Airbnb, is to double check that she's not renting it to one person and ends up bringing like twenty, and that has happened to her before. So that's why she put a camera and she had to report it to Airbnb saying, hey, 
they had a full party and they were not supposed to do that. That would be either a different price point or against the Airbnb owner's rules. How do you find the best places to stay? I read the reviews. I don't stay in places with no reviews. It, generally, I have not been in a position where I am very had lack very little choice in terms of the reviews. So, uh, <laughs> Wendy says, camera behind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Airbnb will forbid parties in houses. Yeah, I think that's generally what they do. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all the comments, the questions. I hope you enjoyed this philosophical chat. Let me know if you did. Um, let me know if you enjoyed chatting, enjoyed the questions. I will be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. for another video here in this beautiful country of Denmark. And then I'm off to other places. Next week, you'll be seeing a new location, a new place, somewhere far, far away in the European continent. Stay tuned. Enjoy the beer, says Mr. Bot. I got some water and some bread. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. You will like and subscribe. <laughs> See you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Danish time. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.